Good evening. We all know how to get how to get to Sesame Street, that happy, safe learning place. But tonight, we want to open your eyes to the global reach that Muppet diplomacy has. Uh, it really, I think, is a mystery to many Americans that it's, there is as many as 150 countries where children actually have access to some of the Sesame Street influences. It's not just the power of Muppets. It is what, uh, what they like to call soft diplomacy. And when you pair that up with national media attention, the kind of information world we live in, uh, this is the kind of power of Muppets that can bridge important gaps, bridges between worlds that seem so different. Uh, it teaches inclusion, mutual respect, and acceptance. Many of you in the audience and in this Harvard community come from international backgrounds. And Sesame Street uh, is kind of considered maybe a TV show with a mission, but I think tonight we'll find out that actually Sesame Workshop, its nonprofit uh, organization, is an organization with a mission and with a TV show. Now we are also, they are now poised to be a role model in the world for the kind of early intervention for traumatized children that will really help some of the most vulnerable children in the world. So with that exciting news, we want to welcome here tonight one of Sesame's most famous ambassadors. He is here with us, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Elmo. Hello, everybody! Yeah. <laughs> oh, hello, Miss Anne. Well, hello there, Elmo. Hi. Oh, Elmo's so excited to be here. Oh, well, do you know why? No, tell me why. Oh, Elmo's happy to be here because Elmo loves going to school and learning. Oh, oh and Elmo's mommy and daddy say that if Elmo keeps learning for a long, long time, Elmo can come to Harvard too. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> well, uh, you are indeed uh, someone who may be young. Yes. But just, is it true you just had a birthday, Elmo? That's true, Miss Anne. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You how, know, how old are you? Three and a half. Re really? Yes. That's well, right. Elmo, how old did you turn last February? Three and a half. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I want to talk to you after this to find out how you do that ah, each year okay. to year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you have done a lot in your three and a half years. Yes. But one thing the folks here may not know, did you know that Elmo has traveled to places that you and I couldn't even imagine going to? Uh, in fact, you've traveled even recently. Tell us about your travel. Oh, well, you know, Elmo loves to travel. Um, I Elmo's met military families all over the country and with the USO, you know? And Elmo even went to military bases in Hawaii and Germany, oh, and Guam, too. Whoa, yeah. whoa. Well, if, uh, when, you, when you go there, especially for military families, yeah. where children face the mom and dad sometimes going away, being yeah. deployed, yeah. Uh, what, what kind of, uh, what kind of help can you give to those families and to those children? Well, you know, Elmo really likes to meet um, the boys and girls who have mommies or daddies in the military because um, they're just kids like Elmo. But, oh. you know, sometimes um, they have to go through what Elmo's daddy calls challenging times. Well, challenging times are indeed something that everybody needs to worry about. You know, they told uh, th what what would you want um, your new friends uh, to know, for American kids, to know about their lives? And what would these children like, um, uh, like uh, American kids to know? Um, well, you know, that's, that's really interesting. Um, you know, Elmo and Elmo's friends try to help kids and families feel better um, when they have to go through something hard. Yeah. You know? Well, I'm sure it, but um, I bet they were happy 
to see you show up. Yeah, I mean, there we were had fun. Uh, you, you could actually go and see some of the refugees. Yeah. Uh, and and it, uh, it, it was happy for them because their life is pretty different from your life on Sesame Street, right? Yeah. But you know, um, Elmer, did, Elmer did get to go um, to a refugee camp in Jordan. And um, that was really interesting. And, you know, Elmer learned that uh, um, maybe some of the kids had to leave their homes because it wasn't safe for them to stay there. And, you know, that made Elmer feel really sad. But, oh. but we had a good time. We, you know, we played games, and Elmer helped make them feel better. Well, I think that it's, when you talk about it's important to be kind, those are the lessons that we le learn at the United at home in the United States, but it's also that people need their help all over the world. It sounds like um, those are really important words to live by, Elmo. And I think that uh, you sharing your wisdom, your three and a half years of wisdom with us, is really, really important, and we thank you. Ah, uh, well, thank you, Miss Ann. Um, you know, Elmo's really enjoying Harvard. Elmo's gonna go explore a little bit more, okay? Okay. Yeah, okay? So Elmo, we'll see you later, everybody. Bye. See you later. Bye, Bye Miss Ann. Kiss, kiss. Mwah. Oh! <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's better than presidents, I promise you. <laughs> we have two wonderful guests to talk to us even more about what, uh, what this broad new world is going to look like. Please wel welcome our two panelists tonight. Gentlemen, come on out. First, Jeffrey Dunn. Uh, with two Harvard degrees, a leadership fellow here, and he left behind a marketing and career building such brands as Nickelodeon, whatever happened to Nickelodeon, and, uh, and three years ago he took the helm at Sesame Workshop, uh, the, uh, to, and it's a time of great global reach out to make kids smarter, stronger, and kinder. George Casey, four-star Army general, commander in Iraq, I covered him as the chief of staff of the army, and I gotta tell you something about General Casey. Not everybody leaves Washington at retirement with more friends left in Washington <laughs> than adversaries. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you both very much thank for you. coming and joining us. <laughs> so in terms of, I'm gonna start with Th this whole idea that Sesame Street is not just a street in some American community. 150 countries where children get some of that Sesame influence. How broad is it? Uh, pretty broad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you know a lot of people here in the United States um, don't realize how broad we are. In fact, a lot of them don't realize that we are a nonprofit, actually. But um, We've been on a journey for a bit of time that has been to really evolve us from being a TV show with a mission to a mission-driven organization. Um, and our mission is to help kids grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. Um, you know, when you think about it, our very foundation is TV, and it's what we've been for 50 years, but TV has changed so much. And the platforms have evolved so much that we are, we had to evolve with it. We're on every platform you can think about. Um, we are one of the biggest networks on YouTube, for example, mm -hmm. um, with billions of page views. But we also um, take a, an old-fashioned VCR and hook it to a car battery and strap it to a, a rickshaw and pedal it into the slums of India and Bangladesh to make sure kids can see it. So the gamut is pretty large, from digital to a rickshaw. Um, and we do this very locally. So you mentioned the 150 countries. I think it's 160 countries, actually, now. Um, and, uh, and we try and do it as much as possible to, um, to bring local people involved, local productions, um, to create local characters. And so um, it's been said now sort of affectionately, which I, I think is a great way to describe it, 
is that we have become known as perhaps the longest and most influential street in the world. The big news for Sesame Workshop came in December with the announcement that the MacArthur Foundation had uh, its first ever $100 million and change uh, competition. That's $100 million <laughs> 100 to accomplish <laughs> change, to really change some social uh, and, and some uh, global problem. What happened in December, and what are you going to do with this? Well, in December, we won, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was good. Um, it was a long process, but, but um, let me start you know, with the big picture. We, um, we're gonna create the largest early childhood intervention in the, in the history of humanitarian response. And um, we're focused on doing this in the war-torn um, Syrian conflict countries. So Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, and um, Syria. And we are going to um, help these kids with something that's called toxic stress. So um, these kids are suffering trauma. Trauma leads to something called toxic stress. And toxic stress um, creates a biological response in the brain that doesn't allow the brain to develop in the way you would want it to. And it ultimately leads to health problems and physical problems, which then creates long-term problems. So Leads to a generation that's, that, that suffers long-term. A, a lost generation, absolutely. Um, so, you know, that's what we're trying to accomplish, and we're doing it with some partners. We're doing it with the International Rescue Committee. Um, we're doing it with NYU, which is gonna do research around this. So specifically, we're, we're, we're gonna do, uh, well, let me take it by age group. So for zero to three-year-olds, we're gonna be having, um, working with 12,000 IRC um, uh, employees who will work with caregivers in these countries to try and um, help them understand what toxic stress is and to give them um, games and help and information um, and activities that ha can help these kids get over sort of the, the issue of toxic stress. And so we'll reach about 800,000 kids that way. For kids who are three to six, a lot of these kids will be in, um, in some kind of um, school or community setting and we're gonna be doing a lot of work to expand the capacity of those schools to train the teachers in those schools or the caregivers. Uh, we're gonna be giving them, again, educational materials, equipment, all kinds of things um, to help improve those. And then overarching across that will be the media. And we will create um, 208 new episodes of Local <coughs> Sesame over the next five years that will be very locally based, that will have local characters and will be adapted to to fit the issues of um, this toxic stress as well as literacy and numeracy and, and, and do it in a way that gives hope and joy. Um, and that will go over the entire thing and that will reach another 9.4 million kids. And so this builds on, we can show you actually a picture from a refugee camp in Jordan where uh, uh, a local, jo uh, one of your Muppets who is a local Jordanian character. Tantan. Um, I'm assuming if that what it's going to be. I can't uh, say. Oh, is that uh, up there? Tantan. You'll, yes, you'll, you'll you. see it back here in a second. The um, uh, the excitement that comes with that when Muppet diplomacy arrives right in the heart of of, uh, of children uh, who, who <coughs> need that kind of hope and the and the messages and the training and the uh, and the feeling of safety and security that they haven't known since being driven from their homes. Yeah, I mean, these are the most vulnerable kids in the world, right? I mean, imagine this. You've had to give up everything. You've left your home. Um, you have nothing, you know, but, but sort of the clothes on your back. And, um, and now you've been put into these, these camps. And, and the average um, refugee is displaced for 10 years. So only w w one of the things w why this is so important is because in the history of humanitarian aid, most of it goes to food and shelter and health. And, and virtually none of it goes to education. Only 2% of humanitarian aid goes to education. But when you think about these people being displaced for 10 years, 
they need the tools that are gonna help them become productive you know, individuals, and that's where education comes in. So, um, so yes, we, ho we hope to bring them you know, joy and laughter, but we hope to bring them some real tools with right. which they can improve their lives. Right. And this leads me right into General Casey, uh, your specialty, obviously coming from the military. I'm not, not related to Elmo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, um, you grew up as an Army brat. You know what it's like to have a, a father deployed, a family move, uh, the stress that comes with that. Uh, Sesame Workshop and Sesame Street characters are already going out uh, and uh, working with military families. Can you tell us about that? Sure. But before I do that, I'd like to just like to piggyback on, on, on what Jeff uh, was talking about. Because from a security perspective, initiatives like this are so important. I, and I have believed for years that, that what we're involved with, this struggle with Islamic extremism, is a long-term ideological struggle. And it's not something that's going to be won by military means alone. And, and the idea that we risk losing a generation of young people, not getting an education, is, is I, I think that, that, that's just horrendous. It, it would just extend that time. And, and just to think about it in terms of time, I, saw it, I read something today that said that today the Berlin Wall has been down as long as it was up. Oh uh, well, that's and, a good thing. And our, <laughs> <laughs> and our last ide our, la our last ideological struggle, the, the Cold War, which was symbolized by that wall, was forty five years. So so this is a much longer term prom proposition, and we can't afford to lose a generation. Now now back to the army brat. Yeah, yes, I was. In fact, my dad and mom are both from Boston, and my dad is from Austin, actually right across from here. And my dad's family was a second generation. Irish immigrant family, five boys, two girls, lived in Austin. All five boys went to Harvard. Both girls went to college. Uh, and my dad, after going to Harvard for a year, went to West Point so that he could serve in World War II, but the war ended before he got to it. Um, I was born in Japan when he was on occupation duty there and lived all over the United States, uh, Germany and Italy. In fact, I, like, so, uh, a lot of army children. I, uh, I went to four high schools in three countries. Uh, there was a, there was a lot of a turbulence at the at the time I was getting ready to go to school. Uh, and then right after I graduated from Georgetown and was commissioned as a second lieutenant, uh, my dad was killed in Vietnam a a month later. And and so not only did I know the, the military life, but I of an army brat, but I knew. The, the, the loss. And so when I returned from Iraq in 2007 uh, and, and started looking at the impact of, at that time, six years at war on the Army, what, what I saw was an Army that was hugely stretched by, by that time. We were sending soldiers over f for one year in combat, bringing them home for a year and sending them right back. And as I traveled around the Army, it was clear that the most brittle part of the force were the families. And enter Elmo and Sesame Workshop. They, they did a wonderful pamphlet, I think probably 2006 or seven, uh, about deployment. It was called Talk, talk Listen, and Connect. And it, and it helped parents talk to their children about deployment. And then a few years later, they came out with another one about grieving. And there's, there was even just a wonderful little storybook called uh, Something Small. And it was Elmo helping his friend Jesse uh, deal with, with how to remember her dad. All those things were usually helpful to, to the military and the military families. Well, that, uh, it's a, a wonderful uh, description of how uh, the Sesame influence can uh, again, help not only uh, children, but help whole families understand. Yeah, can, can I just uh, piggyback on what you were saying and, uh, for a minute? Um, our whole history, if you think about it, um, we started with, um, here in, obviously in the United States, but we started with uplifting sort of the American urban child because those were the ones that were the most vulnerable. And then we went into, you know, foreign, um, countries and and then we uplifted military 
children, and then we uplifted um, kids who were forgotten because of incarceration, their parents were incarcerated. We took on um, health issues. We've taken on kids with special needs, um, autism we just took on. Our, our point of view on this is we have uplifted all these kids. Um, there are no more vulnerable kids in the world today that need more uplifting than this group of kids. And, um, and that's why we've, we've taken this one on in terms of MacArthur. You know, the Sesame Workshop also has partnered with the USO. And, the, and they, they've been partnered for a decade. And as part of that, they go around to military bases and put on presentations to military families. I, I happen to be the chairman of the board of the USO, so I, I checked today and said, how many have we touched? Almost 600,000 servicemen and women and their families have been touched by a Sesame Workshop in that week, in that time. The, uh, another thing that you, you talked about was the importance of family, and, and we know this. Um, again, we have always made stuff that tries to involve the parents as well as the, um, as well as the child, right? There's many parents that <laughs> love Elmo as, uh, as there are children in some ways. And again, that's so important to this work because we know that toxic stress, um, the key to this in a lot of ways is nurturing parents. And, and so a lot of this work is to involve families in, um, in their kids' lives in a way that will um, tackle this issue. And that, and that, that is a, uh, a universal language that uh, not only in the United States, in, in different regions, different cultures. And Sesame Workshop goes to such care to make sure that the product, the, the effort it's bringing, is so well tailored to the culture and the customs and the norms of the community. Going into that Syria conflict region, you're dealing with uh, customs and, uh, and religious uh, doctrine and uh, cultural, cha cultural situation, where how do you make sure that the, the Sesame presence is authentic and can be accepted? Well, we work with local um, educators. We look with, work with local government officials. We look, work with uh, production companies, you know, talent. It's all done very locally to try and make sure that we understand the cultural nuances. So, and, and we've done this all over the world. So when we created um, Kemi in, in South Africa um, for Takalani Sesame, we were tackling HIV AIDS. And that was, a, that was a hugely important thing, and it was very culturally sensitive. And you have a Muppet. And we have a Muppet, Cami, who is um, uh, HIV positive and lost a mother to, um, to AIDS. And, and so you know, we had to do that in a very local way, being very sensitive to the cult cultural issues. Um, in Afghanistan, we're, we're working on um, girls' empowerment in many ways. And we have um, a Muppet Sari, and, and that's in some ways her role. But again, it's all developed with local people, local production companies. Um, I was in India, I guess, um, about a year ago, um, and, uh, and, and went on site you know, with the local production companies. And um, you know, they're, they're, it's all local people doing this. We, we provide the help and the, and the educational knowledge in many cases, but we really want this to be authentically theirs. And one of the most fascinating things, I don't know what your experience has been, but as I travel around the world, so many people think that Sesame is theirs. They, they don't, I mean, in the <laughs> same way that in the United States, people in the United States think, oh, I didn't know you did this all over the world. You know, you go to India, you go to South Africa, you know, and all these countries, Japan, um, they had no idea that it was an American show. It's so locally based that they think Sesame is theirs. It's a li little easier to sell Elmo than it is an American soldier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do, you, General, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the long uh, road it's going to take with uh, Islam and the, and the kind of concrete. How do you keep Sesame Street Muppets and Sesame Workshop from being pulled into the political? Well, because you don't take political sides. The only side you take is that of the kids. That, that's true. You ask him here, you ask him. You ask him me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought you said general. Sorry. I asked no, no, both of you. No, no, no. no. <laughs> No, that's really true. We, um, we are a non-political organization, and, and our, look at, um, as you just saw, our, our audience is like 
three feet tall, okay? And they don't vote and they don't pick sides. So everything we do is from the point of view of what's right for these kids. And, um, and that's what guides everything that we think about and everything that we do. So um, we, st we stand clear, we get a lot of people with inbound questions or whatever, we stand completely clear. The question is, how are we helping this child? Are we doing the right thing educationally? Are we doing it in a culturally sensitive way? Um, and all the rest of it is kind of noise. Yeah. And in general, in terms of the military? Well, no, as I look at that, I mean, you're, you're shaping the next generation. And even though they don't vote now, they will vote. And the fact that they can come to the uh, polling station with a, with a better education and, and better able to evaluate the choices that they have, it, I think, is huge. Um, the other thing, it, it, this is completely non-governmental. That's right. You know, if you have a TV set, if you have a cell phone, you can connect, and you connect with, uh, with, with Sesame Street. And, and that, that allows them to go any, any place and influence you know, a generation of people without the government being involved at all. And I think that's hugely important. And th that leads me to, to as ask you, Jeff, what um, my kids grew up watching Sesame Street on a television set. What's the biggest way that you, especially with a hundred million and change uh, challenge to go, how are you going to get into refugee camps? Do they have TV uh, available? Do, uh, how do you reach into, uh, into the, the most so, vulnerable kids? Right, okay, so a couple of answers to that. Um, first of all, this is one of the reasons we partnered with the IRC. The International Rescue Committee is probably the premier organization at doing refugee humanitarian aid around the world, and they have thousands of people in region um, who are, we're gonna be uh, using to help uh, you know, address on, on a caregiver basis and, and these sites. Um, but it's also true that TV is pretty ubiquitous and cell phones are pretty ubiquitous now. So 90% of, of the households in those countries and in these camps have access to TV. 80% have access to a mobile phone. If you've done any traveling around the world, you know that if you have nothing else almost, you have access to a TV and you have access to a mobile phone. It's, Media um, is omnipresent around the world. So that's one of the great things about what we do. We can do at scale. We can reach places that education um, can't go, that schools don't exist. We can be there in ways that um, traditional education cannot. And that's thanks to the, to the new digital age. Thanks to the old TV age and the new digital age, yeah. yes. Before we open this up for questions, we have microphones around the area. I do want to ask, um, uh, something, this is based on the MacArthur uh, uh, grant to you. Uh, Jeff, you told me one of the things that you hope to do is have Sesame Workshop uh, reach into the early childhood intervention, so important, and be a role model so others can pick up the, uh, the, yeah. the, the mission and carry it forward. <coughs> how, how will that work? Well, so one of the big things, and I think this is one of the reasons uh, you know, MacArthur chose us, um, was that there, as I mentioned, there has never been really any amount of money spent at education in humanitarian settings. And so a big part of what we're gonna do is not just help the kids and families in this region, but to build a model that can be exported uh, you know, around the world. And an evidence-based model um, that is backed up by scientific evidence. That's what NYU is going to do. They're going to do the research on this. So a real key objective of this is to come out with a transformative educational model that can be used in humanitarian aid around the world. And, um, and we hope that we will be able to, and we believe that if we can demonstrate the effectiveness of this and the effectiveness of educating these kids at this time in their lives under these conditions, that there will be um, others who, in governments and foundations, et cetera, that will understand the power of this and want to do it elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, there's that famous Wordsworth saying, the child is father of the man, right? If you want to see, see what a society is going to look like 20 years from now, see how they're taking care of their kids today. So I think one of the reasons we got this, we're going to create a blueprint that can be taken around the world and address this in humanitarian uh, settings you know, across the globe. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to invite people to come on up to the microphones now. And there's one here. I see uh, one up in the balcony level here, another here, and a fourth there. And real quickly, while people are making their way to the, uh, to the microphones, how stiff was the competition to get $100 million in change? Well, it was very stiff, obviously. <laughs> um, we, there were, I think, 7,000 people um, started. They got it down to 1,904, uh, which is an interesting number. Then they got it down to 800. Then they got it down to 200. Then they got it down to four. And, um, and you were one of the last I, four. And you went and made a presen four. presentation. And, um, out in Chicago to, to make the presentation. There are people here in the audience that uh, participated very much in that. Um, so yes, and, it, it, and look at the beauty of the process in a way, though it was very rigorous, is it has made us think a lot about how you do this, right? So we, this process lasted almost a year and a half, and so we have a head start in thinking about this in terms of um, you know, what we're gonna do, how we're gonna do it, how we're gonna work with the IRC and NYU and all this kind of stuff. Um, so it, it was a very rigorous, time-consuming process. A lot, of, a lot of weekends were burned by a lot of people I'm very grateful to, um, uh, kind of thing. But um, it's, it, it's nice to win, and I, um, I, I feel for the Patriots um, last night. <laughs> well, <you> know, <laughs> but, uh, I'm going to start at this microphone and then up here. Uh, we have uh, the Harvard Forum, JFK Junior Forum tradition. We'd love to know who you are. And we'd love to hear your question, and a question ends with a question mark. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Gabriel Obama. I'm just a student. And so my question is, how do you attract the parents to the cause? Because you want the parents to mm. like and approve of what the children are learning from with your various economic, educational backgrounds. And especially for, you know, a, unfortunate multi-generational refugee camp. Yeah, so, yeah, sure. So the, um, there's a couple of ways. Um, we're creating materials to help these primary caregivers. So uh, we have very much a focus in understanding that if we're gonna um, ease the toxic stress that these kids are undergoing, one of the best ways to do that, and maybe even the primary way, is for them to have a healthy relationship with their parents or caregivers. And so a huge part of what we're doing is to educate those parents and caregivers about the importance of this and to supply them with activities and games and information that they can do with these kids that will help form that bond. So that's a very targeted part of what we're gonna be doing here, this real education that's gonna go to those caregivers. When it comes to media, we've always done this. I mean, if, if you're familiar with us, we've always created the show sort of on multiple levels. So um, we have done you know parodies and characters of things that appeal to adults because we've always wanted adults to watch with kids. If a parent watches with their child, the child learns more because the parent engages with the child. So we say, sort of pioneered the concept of the dual level um, show that worked on, on both levels. Uh, yes, right up here. Good evening. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Tom McLaughlin. I'm a master's in public policy student, and um, before that, I was also a pediatrician. And I've seen in my practice firsthand lots of children who've had uh, toxic childhood stress and have taken care of uh, refugee children as well, and, and I'm glad to hear that this problem is getting the attention that it deserves. And it's a hard problem. It's a hard problem to improve toxic childhood stress. And so my question is, how have you shown or studied the impact on tangible health outcomes like parental attachment style or what have you? And how are you planning on monitoring that to demonstrate that this has an impact on those health outcomes? So there's a whole, with everything we do, there's a body of um, experts and educators that we um, work with because we want to bring the very best of that um, learning to us. But one of the really important parts of this program and what we pitched um, to MacArthur was the research that will go into this. So NYU is going to be doing um, a huge amount of research at every level of this thing. So I mentioned those different touch points, right, with caregivers and community centers and, and the media. And NYU will be researching um, uh, as a baseline 
at a midpoint and at the end point, every single one of those to study its effectiveness and to try and understand what works and what doesn't work because at the end of this, one of the real goals is to build a science-based, evidence-based um, uh, mo model that can be taken elsewhere in the world to, to address this issue. Yeah, thank you. Thank Good you. question. Can I move over here, please? Good evening. Hi, my name is Despina Lyolu. I'm a master's student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I'm a former teacher for refugee camps in Greece. Go Hudson. Uh, all right, all right. <laughs> and from my experience uh, working at those camps, I often saw that along with toxic stress came factors and experiences that, um, well, the causes, right? There was often hunger, abuse, uh, fear of deployment, or chronic, you know, limbo of not going anywhere, not doing anything. And it was especially that case for the kids. So I was wondering um, how Sesame Street helps alleviate, helps ameliorate toxic stress in, for, in children while conditions may not change around them and my, while these circumstances might keep getting worse or staying the same. Interesting, when, may I ask, when were you in uh, those camps in Greece? I was in 2015 and 2016 as well. Thank you. So yeah, it's a good question, and, and, right? And it's really hard, um, but a huge part of this, going back to, I think, an earlier question, is related to the relationship between themselves and their parents and their caregivers who are you know, in these situations as well. And, and we know that the, the more in the uh, deep that bond is, the stronger that bond is, the more it can address some of these issues. So um, it is, in some ways, about educating um, these parents of what, what their role is uh, to help help deliver this, and, and as far as the the actual show itself goes, what we've always tried to do is model behavior, and we've tried to give voice to the feelings that the kids have. So if you watch the show, there's a lot of interaction. What are you feeling, and and working f um, through that and through those feelings. So we will try and model some of the behavior that these kids are experiencing, and then try and um, you know provide behavioral answers to that. Um, so I think we're also, as part of this, it's always been true about our shows, we try and make them humorous, we try and bring joy, we try and make them something that is uplifting. Um, so yes, in, in everything we do, we try and make it um, a, an uplifting answer as well as a, a real um, um, you know, fact-based answer. I wonder if that same kind of point about the, the idea that the, the circumstances may not show any signs of changing applies to the military where you're, we're in now the longest wars the United States has experienced. And for military families, it's voluntary, and it's not, uh, uh, there's, a, there's no draft, there's no conscription. Um, are families feeling um, the, uh, military families feeling the kind of sense of, of hopelessness that this will never end, this will never stop, the deployments will never yeah, go away? I, I'd say not, not so much anymore, but in 2006 and 2007, where, where it was really hard, I mean, it, it, it took until the end of my time as the Army Chief of Staff, so four years, to, to get the rotation down to where they had two years at home in between deployments. Uh, but during that period, uh, six, seven, eight, there were a lot of people that felt that way. And, and, and frankly, we, we had to double the amount of money that we were putting toward family programs. And we went from 700 million to 1.4 billion dollars on, on the families wow. because it was so significant. And has the military learned from Sesame uh, Workshop and the, from the uh, from the, the kind of reach out? It's, it's easier to take it from Elmo than it is from your first sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine. We have a question right down here and I'll come up here. Okay, my, my name is Jean Zhou. I come from China. I'm just a prospective student uh, for the Harvard Kennedy School. I have two questions. First question is that there are um, millions uh, left behind the children in China. That means their parents work in the cities, but mm -hmm. uh, they just uh, they can't they can't bring the children uh, with them, so they have just just leave them at the hometown. Um, when I was a volunteer teacher at the countryside, I found that most of the left behind the children are lack of love. They are yeah. they are very lonely. So is there some uh, special? Product from a uh, uh, workshop to help the left behind children. 
uh, like you do, the company do for the refugee. Uh, the second question is that now is the AI age. Uh, is there some plan that the workshop, um, the company will combine with the in artificial intelligence technology to make the product uh, uh, from the company better for the children? Thank you. Well, let me take the, the second one first and come back to the, to the China one. So, um, you know, if you think about television, we talked about earlier, I think you mentioned this first, that, that the beauty of television and media is that it transcends um, locality, right? In, in this country and in many countries, um, the kind of education you get very much depends on where you live and, you know, who your parents were and things like that. And, and so it's, the quality of education differs a lot uh, by area. When, when Joan Gans Cooney and Lloyd Merced started Sesame, I, I'm not sure this was an intended benefit. I think they were really trying to help a, a group of vulnerable kids. But the beauty of it was it went right over and, and was able to reach um, everybody. And so um, we are working now. Well, th that's the beauty of it. Now, the downside of it is that it hits all kids the same way, right? And, and the holy grail of education is customized learning. How do, how do you deal with the way a kid wants to learn, the, the, the things that interest them, et cetera? And so what we'd like to do now is to figure out how to reach large-scale numbers of kids but with adaptive learning that's tailored to their individual needs and requirements. So we're working with IBM and their Watson uh, technology, which is the, the largest and uh, mo most robust adaptive learning technology in the world. And we are trying to create that platform now to help with that. And, um, and we're in pilot right now in Georgia um, to see how that's going and, and you know, knock on wood, it's going pretty well. So we get completely, how do we use a, adaptive intelligence, but we're at the early end of it, and I think it is the holy grail, and, and I do think it's why media, it's one of the reasons I, I feel so positive about what media can do and technology can do in the future, because schools will never be able to um, afford and pay for the amount of customized learning that technology, if we can figure it out, can deliver at scale. So, um, so I think exciting times are ahead for that. Now, we've been in China. Um, Big Bird went to China, you know, decades ago, pretty much right after Nixon um, came to China. Big Bird came to China and walked along the wall. It's one of the most famous things when you, if you go to China, when you go to China, well, you've been there. I don't know if you've <laughs> seen some of it, but uh, you live there. But uh, certainly when I've been there, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big thing. And, um, and so uh, we've had a presence in China for, for quite some time. Um, we have not, I'm gonna be very honest, we have not focused on these kids you know, left behind and, and we know what, a, what an issue that is. I mean, it's also sort of similar in the orphanages of Russia and some of the Eastern European countries where they had these whole, whole kids that were you know, sort of left without their parents and, and what that did when they didn't have you know, emotional involvement. Um, so our, our work in China has not focused on the kids left behind. It is focused on helping you know, sort of all kids but hopefully what will come out of this refugee work um, is a model for how we can take this program to other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a couple more questions that we can try to get to. I'm gonna come up here to the, uh, to the gallery and then down here. Thank you, good evening. Good evening, um, my name is Will Butler. I'm here at Harvard uh, for an executive leadership course. Um, I'm based in Boulder, Colorado and work for an organization called Unreasonable. Um, ah. Yeah, and I we we know in recent block. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we work in service of, of entrepreneurs around the world who are um, creating products and solutions that are impacting people's lives, children's lives, or the environment. Um, and my question, I'm really just interested how partnerships like this come together. It seems like rather unlikely. Um, you know, Sesame doing their thing, the U.S. government, U.S.O. doing their thing. How did how did you two come together? Um, and um, I guess that's my general question. Yeah. Well, you've heard this, the um, answer that um, success is a thousand fathers and failures an orphan. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, backstory about how, how this came together, um, you know, including their Harvard connections in terms of who met who and things like that. But, but the reality is um, when we made a decision that we want to help these kids, when we decided that, you know, these kids are most, the most vulnerable in the world, it was before the MacArthur announcement. Um, it was like a year before, maybe more than MacArthur announcement. And, um, 
And so we set out to, to figure out, okay, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna help these kids? And so we sort of looked at the world and said, who, who are the best partners? And um, it was pretty clear to us, we brought media expertise, but we didn't bring that on the ground presence that we thought we needed and that the IRC did. Um, so that was what really drove it. And we actually announced the partnership uh, before MacArthur that ever came out. And so we announced it at, at, uh, at a humanitarian summit, I think in March of 2016. Um, and it was about three months after that that the MacArthur announced their, their idea. And, um, and we said, uh, there be some funding, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Hundred million dollars will go a long way towards um, towards helping the work that we do. So, um, so we got together based on the idea, and then um, and then went after MacArthur together. And that's another way I think in which Sesame Workshop is trying to set up a model so that other uh, countries, other organizations, other other movements can follow their lead. So one of the things we've been on a a bit of a journey here, a transformational journey in some ways for the last uh, few years. But one of the things, and, it, and this goes back to, um, you know, how do, how do we, how big we, we can be and expand, is can we partner with others? If we only try and do everything ourselves, right, then the, the impact that we can have is much less than if we decide to partner with other people and, and find mission aligned uh, groups who believe what we do and, and we can partner together to tackle something and so um, we're trying to do a lot of that and this is a just one example of that um, mission aligned groups tackling a bigger problem neither one of us could do this alone but together we can have a big impact wonderful thank you and thank you for the you. service that you guys do oh thank you good evening hello um, my name is emily dickey and i'm also a student at the graduate school of education um, and so when i heard you talking i heard a lot about psychoeducation for parents and other really wonderful initiatives to try to build resiliency against childhood toxic stress. And then I also heard you talking about um, education. And I know that building that resiliency is a critical condition for educational success in the future. But I was wondering if there are any components of your work that has more linkages to teachers or sort of a, um, or if you're working more in that preparing students to be successful learners um, in whatever academic opportunities exist. Um, later, so just sort of that link between those two. Well, so so the education um, is sort of you know broad. We we teach literacy, numeracy, um, we teach uh, social emotional issues, we work on things like um, gender equality, um, kind of thing, and then we also work on these issues of toxic stress. So th there's going to be a lot. Of the, the educational is uh, offerings are going to be pretty rich um, that will go across this, but I think it will be a bit differentiated. So the, the zero to three uh, will be much more about how do we develop these brains? How do we develop a bond? How do we create the um, you know, emotions that overcome the trauma and the stress of, of where they are? And as they get older, then more actual educational principles will be um, introduced and, and the show will do both, as I said, and try and do it in a way that is joyful and hopeful and, and help these kids. Glad, you. glad we got an education question in there. We have, I think we have time for at least one more question. Good evening. Hi, um, I'm Grace, a first year student at HPS. Um, I was wondering, um, I, had, I worked in media for a little bit before and um, understand that you know, uh, Sesame Workshop has really valuable IP. So I was wondering why it's a nonprofit and not a media company. Um, is that your question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, because, <laughs> because we, yeah, I mean, ahead. instead of like having grants and um, receiving funding, Sesame Workshop could actually probably monetize its IP to. You know. um, well, that's a HBS question. Um, <laughs> Hugsy HBS. Um, <laughs> so, uh, look, at, we've always been a nonprofit, and, it <laughs> and it's true that over time we've we've built up uh, this IP, but we we generate um, earnings off that pie, uh, IP in support of the mission. What, what drives us is how to help kids. It's not about the monetization. We're not in it to make money. We're in it, in it to help kids. And so, um, you know, the IP is used sort of in, in service of that. Um, but 
we, we also said, if, if we're gonna help kids grow smarter, stronger, and kinder, you know, one of the things you have to say is, well, how are you gonna do that? And we said we were gonna do it in three ways. The first was we were going to be makers of content. We're just gonna be great makers of content across all platforms around the world. And the second thing we said is we're, we've always been researchers, so we're going to be researchers to help um, bring information about kids and families and media practice. And then this third part is about instigating others and partnering with others who share our mission and our values. So everything we do is in service of that mission of helping kids grow smarter and stronger and kinder. Um, we have no intention of monetizing the IP like National Geographic did and, and selling it. And, and when we do license it to other people, it is in the service of generating income that can be then used to, to create the show um, and further the you know, uh, social uh, and community in involvement that we have um, around the world. So it's, it's money to forward a mission. Thank you. We're, we're gonna squeeze in one more question. Are you, are you waiting with a question? Okay, and are you quite, okay. Our last question for this evening, good evening. Hi, my name's Laura, I'm also at Hugsy. Um, so I've heard you mention several times tonight making kids kinder. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, I was really glad to hear that the Muppets created in different locations were created by people within those cultures. And I was just wondering if you all had thought about or had any plans to have those Muppets travel to kind of spread that kindness and teach about their culture to other parts of the world. Well, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, really, just for the first time, um, we got some of those Muppets who came to New York and, we, and we're doing in this upcoming season a um, sort of global, um, some global uh, work around kindness, which is gonna feature the Muppets from around the world, and that was really um, pretty exciting. So we do have some Muppets that, that do travel, um, so to speak, and you can see them in different um, you know, uh, versions of the show around the world. Uh, but it's also true that we have local ones that don't travel as much. So we're gonna, we will figure out as it comes to this, like what the role of Tauntaun will be that's sort of already there. Um, but, but it's an interesting idea. We're, we're trying to figure out like the global nature of how we can use and have these travel. And you heard Elmo traveled. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. he, he's a traveling guy. Um, so can I come back, if, if we're gonna, sure. can, I, can I come back to the HBS one for one second again? Absolutely. Um, I just want to say this, because um, I start. I, I went to HBS, I, I started in a for-profit. Um, this is the most rewarding thing I've ever done. It's also the hardest thing I've ever done. It's much harder doing a non-profit than it is doing a for-profit because it's, it's clear in a for-profit, you're just trying to make more money. Here, it's, you're trying to you know, service a mission. And um, I'm a huge believer, and, and I would say this to, to anybody from HBS, I think we're living in critical times, and um, you know that Calvin Coolidge famously said um, that um, the business of America is business. And I think we're gonna need increasingly um, a group of corporate leaders in this country who also believe um, that the business of business is America. And we're gonna need to solve some of the real problems that we have uh, if we are gonna prosper as a nation and education is probably the biggest one we're gonna have to take on. If we, if we don't solve the educational gap in this country, we do not have a future of prosperity and we do not have a, a future of, of uh, morality. Um. Yeah, no, a good point. And I, <laughs> and, and I want a final, final word from, from General Casey too. Are you generally optimistic about the years ahead? Is the general generally optimistic? <laughs> <laughs> I generally am, man. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, it's, it's interesting. You, you know, when I, and I look out there and I see that millions of people have been brought out of poverty, you know, in, in the last, tw you know, tw 25 years or so. But, but the fact that still 20% of the world's population controls 75% of the world's wealth, and almost half the population of the world is living on $2.50 a day. I mean, that, that goes with the education challenges, the income disparities. Um, I am optimistic uh, from the point that since I've left the military and I, and I thought the Army was a pretty big organization, you know, a million people all over the world. At the, at when, I, when I took over, it had about a quarter of a trillion, trillion dollar budget. So it was, it, was a, it was a big business. 
But as I've, as I've left the military and gone out and I've seen the creative spirit and the innovation that just is, is all over the country, yeah, I, I'm amazed by that. And, and, that, and that helps me be positive. But if I, if I could just wrap up with one thing Please. here is, um, you know, this, is, this MacArthur is a, is a private initiative. Yeah. But it, we need the public and the private sector together. And this president's budget cut the foreign aid budget by 32%, 32%. Now, to their credit, Congress has added quite a bit back in, and it's probably going to come out to a cut of 10 to 15%. But that's, that's not the kind of foreign aid budget we need today because prosperity is, is, in my view, is what this is all about over the long term. And it's going to take education, and it's going to take jobs, and it's going to take health care, uh, and it's going to take food and water. And instability is not our friend in this long-term ideological struggle. And the more that we can enhance stability through prosperity, the better off we're all going to be. Right. And it's going to take Muppet uh, what is it? The Muppets Muppet are the diplomacy. tip of the soft, soft. power spear <laughs> uh, in American diplomacy. Well, I cannot thank the two of you enough. I think we have opened, uh, especially with a, 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 an audience here at Harvard, I, which I can always count on being so international in view, uh, we have not only kind of expanded our uh, view of things, but I think we've also had some fun. Okay, Elmo is ready. Okay, let's start the discussion, okay? Now. Oh. Well, my goodness, Elmo, what brings you back? Well, Elmo was just sort of exploring, and um, but Elmo's back and ready to hear the discussion. So oh. let's hear it. Oh, well, we, we always have some fun. We we're just wrapping up our discussion. So you're done? Well, we're, oh. we're, pre we're, um, we're pretty wait much. Wait a minute. You mean, you mean Elmo missed it? The fun is over? But, but Elmo wanted to learn. Elmo wanted to learn all about everything, Miss Anne. Oh, but. Oh, isn't that sad? Oh. <laughs> 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 but let me tell you something. What? The fun is never over, and the learning is never over. And Elmo, you know that. Yes. That we don't, uh, we don't ever stop learning. And what I'd like to do. Yes is after we thank all these people for coming to listening to all this conversation, uh -huh. maybe we can go backstage and you could tell me more about those children you've been meeting around the world because I would find that fun. Well, that sounds like a plan, Miss Ann. <laughs> well, thank you very much and thank all of them for yes, coming to you, see everybody. you. thank you, everybody. loves you. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to General and to Jeff Dunn. Thanks for coming. And Bye -bye. thank you, Elmo. Bye, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much.